Hey, what's up coders? I'm Coderius and today we are coding a multi-threaded program using the Unity job system. For that we will use the model board set we did in the previous video. As we've seen, this type of algorithm can be greatly improved using parallel computing. So the concept will be about the same as what we did last time with the compute shader, but this time using the cores of the CPU. And that's where the Unity job system comes handy. It provides an easy way to implement multi-threading. That will be the topic for today's video. Before we start, take a moment to like, subscribe and leave a comment. As always, supporting material will be available in the description. I see you in Unity. We can start with our previous CPU version of the project and open it in Unity. To measure the effectiveness of our optimizations, it would be good to check how long it takes to render a frame. So let's add the text in our existing Canva. I use TextMesh Pro, which is now part of the Unity packages. We center and stretch the text so it will go automatically on the top left corner. We can then add a new C-sharp script to our Canva, call it Mandelboard Jobs, and open it in Visual Studio. Let's just copy-paste our previous Mandelboard script and change the name of the class back to Mandelboard Jobs. First, we need to add a few more packages. The Team Pro package to work with TextMesh Pro, the Unity Jobs package for multi-threading, and we don't actually need the Mathematics package, but I forgot to remove it while recording the video. Then we declare a public text mesh pro UGUI variable, and that's the complicated name for the text mesh pro text, and call it time frame. On top of that, we want a color array to place our pixels and copy them in one go to our text 2D. We use a color32 array, which is faster than simple color array, as it uses four times less memory. Don't forget to initialize the color array in the start function. The size will be the number of pixels on the screen, which can be easily calculated by multiplying the screen width by the screen height. Let's also have the time it takes to render a frame displayed on the screen. For that, we can measure the start time with the function time.realtimes in startup. We do the same at the end of the function and display the difference. Sorry for the vegans out there, but now it's time to get to the meat of the matter and implement the job system. For clarity's sake, we will first convert the function to a single-threaded job and move from there to the multi-threaded version. Have a look at the Unity documentation in the description, it really helps understanding the concept. Alright, the first thing we have to do is to convert the Mandelbrot escape function into a job. So let's copy the function and move up to the beginning of our class. If you watched the previous video, you saw that for parallel computing, data needs to be structured and then sent to the different processors. Here, the approach is the same. The Mandelbrot escape function needs to be standardized so it can be executed on each core of the CPU. So let's create a public struct and name it Mandelbrot. The struct implements the iJob interface. Its members are the point on the real axis and the imaginary axis, the x and the y axis if you want so, the maximum number of iterations and a variable for the output. The output data from jobs goes into native arrays. So here we create na a native array of integer and call it result. Make sure everything is set to public. By implementing the iJob interface, we inherit from the execute function which must be implemented. That's where we place our Mandelbrot escape function. We can just copy our previous function and adjust the variable names. The only thing we need to change is that we no longer need the iteration count which will be directly copied in the result variable and we also reset the result before starting the loop again. We only use the first position of the native array. We no longer need the old Mandelbrot function and can delete it. Before creating the job and running it, we need to create the native array that will be used by the job. We can create it at the beginning of the function. It has a size of 1 as it is a single threaded job and is initialized with allocator.tempjob as a second parameter. In our run Mandelbrot function, we can now create a job and run it. We create a new Mandelbrot struct and call it Mandelbrot. We first need our x and y coordinates. For that, we can use the same expressions as we had before. Max iterations equals max iterations, and we pass the newly created native array onto the struct. All right, we're almost done. When executed, jobs return a job handle. It is used to manage priorities and dependencies between jobs. That way, we create a new job handle, assign the result of the job with model.board.schedule, and wait for the job to be completed with the complete function. The result of the function sits now in the first position of our array, so we can use it to color the texture. We can optimize the code a little bit by putting the colors in an array and then copying the array at once in the texture. For that we need to switch the order of the x and the y in our loops. The array has one dimension, but we have the x and the y. 
To translate this, it's very easy. We take the x plus y multiplied by the width of the screen and call the setColor function on the result we get from the job. OK, we can get rid of the code here and finally assign the color array to the texture with the function setPixel32. One very important step is, like with the buffers in the compute shader, we have to get rid of the native array with the dispose function at the end. Before trying, we need to make a quick adjustment to the setColor function. The standard color is composed of float values between 0 and 1, whereas color32 uses integers. Reason why, it's also a bit faster. It's quite cumbersome, but we have to get rid of all divisions in the setColor function and make sure the alpha is set to 255. The function now returns a color32, so we can also use color32 instead of the standard color elsewhere in the code. OK, that was a lot. Let's give it a shot and see if it works. Everything seems to be working, but, well, it's even slower. More than 4 seconds to render the image in play mode versus about 1.5 in the standard version. That's probably normal as the loop has to wait for the job to complete before going to the next iteration. No worries, that's why we will upgrade this to a multi-threaded job. But before that, I think it would be a good idea to also put the setColor function in a job. So we are fully ready for the next step. Let's copy the inside of our setColor function and move back to the beginning of the script. We create the struct setColor, which inherits from iJob. As member, we only need the input value, i.e. an integer, the max number of iterations as integer, and the output as a native array of color32. We use the max iterations to avoid doing the modulo calculation and return the default color instead. Now we want to copy our function inside the public void execute function. At the end of the function, just change the return function by an assignment of the calculated color to the color output. We can then delete the original setColor function. Back to the run Mandelbrot function, we can launch the second job. Let's first create a native array of color32 to feed the struct. Then we create an instance of the setColor struct and call it setColor, I'm sure you guessed the parameters. Value is the result of the previous job, max iterations is our max iterations, and we pass on the native array of color32. Now that's where the job system comes handy. We create a second job handle and run the job on it, but as parameter, we give the first handle. This will work as a dependency, making sure this job does not start before the previous job is complete. After the schedule, we call the complete function to make sure the second job is done and put the result in our color32 array. Don't forget to dispose of the color32 native array to avoid memory leaks. Alright, let's give it a try. Everything works fine, but well, the performance is clearly not there, with about 6.5 seconds to perform a single render. Don't worry, we will solve this now and use multithreading. Unity had one job, now it will have several. Back to Visual Studio, the first thing we need to do is change the iJob inheritance to iJob parallel 4 and convert the inputs to native arrays as well. The max iterations is a single input, hence does not need to be in a native array. The execute function from iJob parallel 4 needs an int as input. 
This will be the actual pixel on the list of pixels we will create later on. You can choose any name for that variable, I use R for result. Then we just need to use that position in our different parameters, and that's it, our motherboard function is ready for multithreading. Let's do the same with the coloring function. The value is a native array of int, add the int parameter in the execute function and refer it where needed. Awesome, our structs are now ready to be multi-threaded. Back to the main function, we need to change a few things. First, the size of the arrays will be the number of pixels on the screen. Second, we create native arrays to have a list of the x's and the y's as double. Alright, we won't create the jobs in the main loop, as we've seen it really slows down the execution. So in the loop we will only prepare the data for the execution. Let's start with the x list and the y list. It takes the value we've calculated before. And as for the position in the array, we follow the same logic as what we've done before for the colors. We invert the x and the y in the loops and convert the two dimensions into one. Ok, so let's move our execution outside the loop and amend it. We still need to create the structs and execute the jobs, but the parameters are a bit different. In the motherboard struct, we just assign the array we've created in the loop. With the inheritance from iJob Parallel 4, the schedule function takes few more parameters. The first one is the size of the data we pass on. All our arrays have the same size, so we can use the length of any of them, like the length of the result array for instance. The second parameter is the batch count. This parameter controls the distribution of work between the threads. The Unity documentation recommends to start with 1 and increase until the performance gain of further increase becomes immaterial. Let's give it a value of 16, and I'll let you test on your side to see what works best with your machine. In the set color struct, we just need to change the value assignment to pass on the full array of result. We can then call our second handle on the set color job, and like for the other job, we pass on the length of the array the batch count and as last parameter the dependency on the first job. Unfortunately the setPixel32 function does not accept native array as parameter, so we need to quickly copy the native array to the original color32 array with a double loop similar to the one used above. Ok, before testing the program it's important to dispose of the additional native arrays. Anyway, Unity will let you know if you forget this step. Ok, let's give it a try now. Awesome, this works fine and the render time is about half of the standard version, but to have a real sense of the performance, the program needs to be built. On my machine, the first render takes about 0.85 seconds on the standard version versus 0.17 seconds on the optimized version. That's about 5 times better, with a resolution of 960 by 540 It is of course not comparable to the performance we had with the compute shader, but it's still acceptable and sufficient to explore the fractal. Before we leave, there is a small tweak we can do to our motherboard function to speed it up a little bit. One of the main issues around the central image is that all the part at the center of the image is with the default color. And that's very costly, because each time the function has to iterate to the max number of iterations to return at the end the default color. With this small tweak, we can exit before starting the loop, which makes some render a little bit faster. One last comment, if you watched the previous video, you remember that the complex number operation in the compute shader is broken down in standard operations, firstly because compute shaders don't have a complex number library to handle such operations, but also because it is in principle faster to rely on standard operations such as multiplication, addition or subtraction compared to using libraries. I tried to implement the same in the multi-threaded version to see if it would improve the performance or not, but the result was not the expected one. My take is that the complex number library in C-sharp is already very well optimized and that adding new native arrays is just slowing down the process. 
Try on your side and tell me what you think in the comment section. We are at the end of the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you give a thumbs up and subscribe. The comment section is open in case you have follow-up questions, feedbacks or remarks. Thanks for watching, keep coding and see you next time!